Hey, uh, I am here. I didn't even check if the audio is working. Uh, it should be. Uh, all right. <laughs> and I'm always trying to get the timing down to get that intro going before I appear on camera. And it's at one second and I hit go and then it doesn't do it. So I got to do it at two seconds. Uh, all right. Uh, today's going to be short one, just an hour. Uh, so I have, I have an event coming up um, on Discord. I'm going to be talking in the Destiny Discord server where I'm going to be talking about my dissertation research. Uh, so I guess I could talk a little bit about that today. I didn't really have a plan for today. So today, maybe I'll just talk about some stuff that's been going on and that sort of thing. Okay, sure. <laughs> Let's get into it. All right. So um, I did, I did I, in the middle of the week, I think it's the first live stream I did in the middle of the week, which I could post a link to, which was a review of something that has really been making the rounds and a lot of people have been discussing it. And that is... Um, this, dis there was this debate on the, whatever, I think it's a podcast, um, with destiny and Trent Horn. If you don't know who they are, um, I actually don't know that much about either of them. I think Trent Horn has a background in philosophy and I think does kind of Christian apologetic stuff. Um, destiny, I don't really know destiny's background, but destiny will talk, talk philosophy stuff occasionally. And so they had a debate about abortion. And what I did with uh, Danny from Phil Talk, and if you don't know Danny, Danny is a friend of mine. Danny has a channel called Phil Talk. In fact, Danny is streaming right now. Uh, so you could go check that out if you want. Uh, or if you're done with what I'm doing here, you could go check out what Danny's doing if Danny's still at it. So Danny's been, um, Danny goes on TikTok a lot. I just had Danny like a hundred times. Well, Danny, it's free promotion. See, I said it again. Uh, <laughs> so free promotion. So Danny goes on, now I feel very self-conscious saying that on TikTok and debates with people, usually it's Christians or people that believe in God. There used to be a lot more topics that I saw initially, but that seems to be the topic that, that really gets people going. So it'll occasionally be an emphasis on like the problem of evil or suffering or that sort of thing. But typically what I see is people arguing about whether God exists. And Danny does a good job of discussing that with people. Uh, TikTok has lots of people on it. And so that that's just a sort of different space that I haven't really explored yet. It's difficult. You know, it's already, it's taken me a while to adapt to YouTube. Uh, so it's, you know, something I might eventually try. So anyway, Danny got together some clips where metaethical topics came up in this debate between Trent Horn and Destiny. And then we reviewed those clips. And we did that earlier this week. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday that we did that. And so you should check that video out. I think it's got the most views of any of my videos so far, which is pretty cool. It looks like it got me, a, a, you know, it netted me some subscribers too. But uh, yeah, so we reviewed that. I thought that commentary turned out really well. And we had a lot more live viewers. So right now I'm seeing it says there's eight people. I think I peaked at 40 people in the middle of the week. So I'm really thinking maybe I need to be streaming more in the middle of the week. It might be, there might be more viewers. I always figured people would be at work or school or something, but apparently, no, people are chilling on the weekends and they watch live streams in the middle of the week, apparently. What time was it? I think it was 5 or 6 p.m. So maybe as people getting out of work. So maybe weekdays in the evening would be better. What do you all think in the chat? And I'll check the chat and say hi to people. Um, so we have Travis Talks here who says yes, probably to the prompt for this video, which is, is moral um, anti-realism evil. It's not evil. Uh, I see Alonzo Fife here. Uh, welcome. I see a good afternoon. I see a message from Meat Machine saying, you know that I will pipe up again this time. Um, I see uh, Pinecone says, hi, dad. I don't know who you're talking to, um, but <laughs> um, I see here from Banner, are you going, are you going to stream it destiny on destiny? It, what, what do you mean? I, I, there's no plan to be on, on destiny's YouTube channel. This is just the discord server and I haven't seen destiny interacting in there. This is with just whoever is on there that I'll be talking to. I see from, uh, I, is it San K-A-S-R? Um, you could let me know how to say that. So I could, I could, it's all in caps. So I don't know if it's an acronym or, or what, but anyway, hi. Um, so you say, hey, oh, Lance. So hello. I see KCA Randy says, hi, Lance. How's it going? I see Meat Machine says, Danny Destiny. I don't know what that means. I don't know what you're talking about. And Casey Randy says I was watching Danny stream earlier. What was going on on there? I only got it like two minutes to check it out before I went live. So I didn't see it. 
Uh, and then Banner says, will you record it or should I just join myself? Uh, as far as I know, uh, it will be recorded. I will ask for a copy. Let me see if I, if the person I asked is going to, they didn't respond. So, um, you know, hopefully they'll, it should be recorded and there should be a copy of my discussion on the Destiny server about my dissertation. The person that's going to be asking me about it, it's like something on Discord I didn't know about where you're on there live, like you go into one of the voice chat things and a lot of people are kind of just in the audience and then there's people that are sort of on stage talking. I guess it's a bit like, it's a feature that's a bit like Clubhouse that's built in to Discord that allows there to be sort of featured speakers. As far as I know, I'm going to be the only featured speaker for this. There's also no strong plan to my knowledge about how long it's going to go. Could be an hour, could be a couple hours, uh, but that's why I got to cut it short today because I got to have dinner and everything and then be ready to do that. So I'm going to be cutting this off in probably about an hour, maybe a little less actually. So I want to finish up around 6 p.m. It's a little after five here today. So this will be a short stream. I know sometimes I do three or four hours. Today is just going to be short. And I don't have a blog post today, so there's not a central theme. I just like the idea of saying, are anti-real estate evil? It, the answer is no uh, for me. So in end of the topic, I think that's all that needs to be said about it. I mean, sure, there's more to say, but all right. So yeah, you could join there, but yeah, it should be recorded. And I'm going to be talking about my dissertation. So very briefly before I, I get to more comments. So the dissertation actually just got the, the hard physical copy. I don't, I don't want to run out of the room and go grab it and find it, but uh, if you remind me, I'll, I'll show you next week. It's printed out like a book. Um, and it, so the dissertation was in uh, psychology. So my PhD is in social psychology. And the dissertation is called Schrodinger's Categories. It's a sort of play on words. A friend of mine suggested the title. I loved it and I went with it. What was especially awesome about it is that it worked with the central metaphor of the dissertation, which makes this analogy between moral realism and quantum mechanics. I'll get into that at some point. But just very briefly, what I argue with the dissertation is that um, it's not the case that ordinary people have uh, meta-ethical stances or commitments. So they don't have explicit beliefs in realism or anti-realism, nor does the way that they speak or, or think or act reliably and determinately best figure into a realist or an anti-realist explanation. It's just sort of underdetermined by what people say and do. Um, um, so... Um, Well, sorry, uh, um, sorry. My my wife dropped in and, and uh, had like a, a question for me, so I had to address that. Um, okay, she was she was very discreet. I don't even think she showed up. I don't even know how she did that. Ninja, because uh, <laughs> it's like there's not a lot of space to navigate here. Uh, that's another thing. I am really gonna have to get a a better setup for the room that I'm in. I mean, I'm I'm getting tired of looking at the room. I mean, the, I could work on improving the camera and, this, and the microphone. What I need is a microphone arm so that I could have the mic right next to my face because I don't know, the audio probably improves if I'm right here. Is the audio better? Because I don't like to have a microphone right in my face. Um, like I would have to hunch down because I don't have an arm for it. It's a, it's a blue Yeti. Let me see if I can hold it up here. Uh, it's, it, the wire is too wrapped up in things behind the computer. But so I have a blue Yeti. I'm sure it's adequate for what I do, but I'm too far from, on this stupid camera keeps auto-focusing. So um, anyway, uh, so in the dissertation, I argue that non-philosophers don't typically have uh, commitments or stances about, uh, about meta-ethical issues, about moral realism and anti-realism. Now that might seem obvious to a lot of people. Sometimes I say that sort of thing and then people are like, well, of course they don't. How would they even know about this? But if you look in the contemporary metaethics literature, there is a widespread presumption among philosophers that in a certain sense, you could almost think of non-philosophers as having implicit philosophical theory. So when people talk about morality, they have an implicit philosophical theory. And the, the goal of the philosopher is to elicit, this is, of course, this isn't the goal of all philosophers and there's a variety of different philosophical projects. But one of the goals of philosophers is to sort of elicit or figure out the implicit philosophical commitments and principles and, uh, and that are sort of in, buried within ordinary language. And by analyzing how ordinary people speak and think, the philosopher can figure out how ordinary people speak and think. Now, that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to endorse it. They may offer reforming accounts where they say ordinary people are wrong about this and we need to fix the way that, you know, the commitments implicit in the way people speak. But there's typically this presumption that is characteristic of all the traditional meta-ethical positions. 
uh, and including all the anti-realist positions, error theory, relativism, non-cognitivism. Look at the way that they're all sort of characterized. They're characterized with their central theses not merely being a metaphysical claim, but also a semantic claim. Error theory starts with this claim, and this is the most clear one. When ordinary people make moral claims, they mean to describe stance-independent moral facts. There are no such facts, so ordinary people's claims are false. It'd be like if people were going around, and this, you know, Richard Joyce and other error theorists use this kind of language, like talking about witches. If, you know, a witch is a person with supernatural power, they might consult with demons and that sort of thing. Well, nobody actually has those powers because demons aren't real and nobody can cast spells for real. Uh, so if someone went around saying witches exist and witches do these evil things and witches cast hexes on people or whatever, all of the statements are false because witches cast hexes on people presupposes witches exist. They don't, so the statement is false. And it'd be the same thing if you were describing unicorns. So if you're like, well, unicorns love to frolic in, in the meadow. Well, there are no unicorns, so they don't like to frolic in the meadow. So the statement that they do is false. And so error theory holds that moral claims are systematically false because they contain false implicit presuppositions. Well, which moral claims? Which ones? Presumably it's the ones people are actually using. Like if it went out and you found people arguing in a bar, like abortion's wrong. No, it's not. Um, those people would be saying false things because they're both committed to this these realist presuppositions. Those presuppositions are false, and so their claims are false. But what if they're not? What if they have no particular commitments one way or the other? Well, an error theory is just wrong. It, it's a incorrect empirical theory about the meaning of ordinary moral claims. And the same is true of relativism, which treats ordinary moral claims as having an implicit indexical element such that when people say things like murder is wrong, they mean something like murder is inconsistent with my standards or murder is inconsistent with the standards of my culture. Um, and then so that is what those claims mean. And then they could be true relative to their respective standards. Well, what if it's not the case that when ordinary people make moral claims that they mean that? Then the relativism is wrong. And so to the extent that the traditional meta-ethical positions, both the realist and anti-realist positions, presuppose certain substantive claims about the meaning of ordinary moral claims, they are committed to particular semantic and I would argue empirical theses that I think are false and they could be false for a variety of reasons. If the claims in question are empirical theses about the uh, communicative intent of speakers, that's an open empirical question. I think the empirical data suggests that there is no definitive determinate and uniform answer. And so the traditional accounts insofar as they pre presuppose uniformity and determinacy are mistaken in either one or both cases. If these are supposed to be some sort of a priori or analytic claims, then I'm going to reject those presuppositions. I don't take the claims to be analytic claims. I take them to be empirical claims. And if they're, if the conception of language in question is one where empirical facts about the psychological states, such as the communicative intent of speakers, are not determinative of the meaning of the moral claims, then I'm, it's likely I'm going to reject those presuppositions. So I don't really fall within the framework of these of the traditional meta-ethical positions. Um, and what's interesting about that is that this is a work in psychology, and yet you see me talking about meta-ethics. I don't see psychology and philosophy as being these fundamentally disparate fields where the methods have to be kept separate from one another. Philosophers go around saying ordinary people mean this. Well, they're doing psychology. Uh, so I, I have really serious issues with this, in part because philosophers are frequently, in fact, almost always just not very clear on what they're doing. It, is cognitivism a, an empirical thesis or not? Uh, it's just not clear. And when you read philosophic works, it often looks like they're engaged in something where it's just unclear how much of it is pres prescriptive or descriptive, how much is psychological, how much is not, how much is it supposed to be relying on a posteriori or a priori claims. They're just not clear. They're not consistent with the terminology. I mean, there's just so many issues. And as I routinely emphasize on this channel, this is a field that prides itself on clarity, precision, and rigor. And if you really dig into what they're doing, there's nothing clear about it, there's nothing precise about it, and there's nothing rigorous about it. It is a sloppy, it's like a presuppositionalist mess uh, where assumptions about them, like the, there's no critical examination of the methods that we're using here. We just do armchair theorizing. They, we examine decontextualized sentences. The whole thing is really weird. Um, anyway, so I'll be talking about my, my empirical research on that. Let me look at the chat a little bit, and then I could say a little bit more about that empirical research. All right, we've got Griff, who is in one of the discussions that we had um, earlier I think with 45 minutes left, I'm not sure it's going to make a whole lot of sense for people to to join the discussion. I, I would consider it, 
but I'm not sure that's the optimal route to take today. All right, let's have a look. All right, so um, so San K A S R says normally shortened to Cass or San. Uh, so let me know what your preference is, and I'm happy to to refer to you that way um, as as Cass or San. I could do I could do either one. Doesn't matter to me. All right. So Meat Machine says it is a good idea to get on a popular stream like Destiny. Yeah, I, you know, it, it's something that I would consider. But if it's a really big channel like that, I kind of feel like, I mean, look, I just passed 600 subscribers like a day or two ago. I have a tiny channel. I don't get a lot of views. I still have a few, like at most, um, I don't think I've hit even 100 subscribers on my Substack yet. So speaking of that, uh, go subscribe to my Substack. It, there's, there's a free option. You don't have to do the paid options. Um, I should say about that, I, I really am planning to sit down in the next, I, I want to say like in a week, but it's more plausibly, it's like a month or two to sort of reformulate um, like how I'm going to do the sub stack. I might have some paid content on there. I might eventually roll out some some merchandise where we get some, I don't know, goofy comments about realism on t-shirts and mugs or something like that. So I'd really like to do that stuff. I think it would be a lot of fun. I think people would appreciate it. So um, yeah, but Destiny, I'm a little, I, I, I think I'm not up for going on there quite yet until I have a larger channel and I have better, like, I have crappy closet doors behind me that look, you can see that they're all crooked. <laughs> like, I need a better setup, you know? So not just a better mic and camera. I need to be in the right kind of room. I need better acoustics. I want some, some like, cool lighting, that sort of thing. I always see all the academic people have bookshelves behind them. I would say I got rid of most of my books, but they've been reaccumulating them until we just ended. Um, we ran out of bookshelf space in an actual bookshelf. Um, so maybe I'll have to buy a bookshelf to put it behind me just to follow the, the all the cool people on having bookshelves with like the LEDs and all that. Uh, maybe I need to put some cool things on there that reflect my interests. So, you know, normally I have a really, I have some in some goal in mind with these streams where I'm like, I'm going to talk about this topic. And a lot of them have been based on blog posts, but today I just felt like not doing that. So I could just talk about whatever. So why don't we do that? Why don't people, if you want to ask me just whatever kind of questions you want to ask, I don't want to get too personal and I don't want to get too into certain sorts of topics, but if you want to throw questions at me, I'm happy to field the questions in the chat. We'll do that for maybe 30 minutes and then I'll head out because I'm going to have to go have dinner, an early dinner so I could be ready for the destiny stream. But yeah, I want to I want to grow this channel a bit before I go on the really big channels. Um, I I do think it would be cool to talk to a lot of people that have discussed meta ethics, especially if they don't have a background or training in it, to share my perspective and see what they think of it. You know, even if it's super critical, um, you know, I do get I do get quite a bit of uh, criticism, but I do tend to emphasize neg negative things. So if people criticize me, I tend to think about that. I'm like, oh, there's all these people criticizing me, but there's people that like the unintelligibility claim, the indeterminacy claim. And I do have to keep that in mind. Um, well, I was going to mention something else. And now I can't remember what it was. Whatever. Oh, right. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I posted about, because I, I started out actually posting on Facebook of all places, and I still argue with people on there, even though a lot of debates have moved off of that platform. It used to be busier back in the day. Um, so I, yeah, sometimes I'll post about other stuff. I do uh, more gastronomic realism jokes there, but yeah, I posted about, um, like video games. I don't really talk about that a whole lot. So sometimes I get into other stuff. It doesn't have to be meta ethics. I just, I've been so focused on meta ethics for so long. It's almost hard to talk about other topics. All right. We have Antonio here saying hi, Lance. Uh, Hey Antonio, what's up? So for those of you who weren't here, I think it was it last week that Antonio hopped onto the stream and we talked for a little bit. So I, I don't think it's going to happen today, but I've been bringing more people onto the stream. And if you know people that is, if they have a background in philosophy, awesome. I want to talk to people that do philosophy, but also people that don't have a background in philosophy. I really want to create bridges between the academic world of philosophy and the non-academic populations out there, people that don't have formal training in philosophy. I think everybody should be talking to one another um, about these topics, philosophy, psychology, my interests. Um, your interests, as long as I care enough about them to want to talk about them. Otherwise, this isn't the channel for them. Uh, but, you know, I also, you know, it's not like I only want to talk to and discuss things with people that don't have training in philosophy. I like to do both. So recently, I started doing more of the videos that I, I, I kept saying, I'm going to do these videos. And I thought I done a few. I was hoping to do more in the summer, but I had a surgery. Uh, 
what is it? Uh, a little over a month ago that held me up. It was, it was, um, periodontal surgery. So I <laughs> couldn't really talk for a few weeks. And then after one of the streams, my face swelled up like a, uh, a chipmunk and I couldn't, it was, it was not good. So that put me out for about a month. Uh, and then it just turns out I don't, it's hard to schedule things with people. Sometimes people are available. Sometimes they're busy. A lot of people take time off in the summer. But there are a few things slated to be coming up and a few cases where people said, hey, I'm out for the summer, but, but you know, set something up with me. I'm really hoping to talk to Philip Goff again. Um, I think Goff is, is just a great person to talk to. I know a lot of people are very critical of Goff's views, but Goff strikes me as someone that is really enthusiastic about engaging with people. Goff, you know, is friends with uh, Keith Frankish. They have diametrically opposed philosophical views and they get along fine. I think we need more of that philosophy. I really just like people being snarky, smug assholes when they talk about people with opposing views. I think it's the thing I like least about engaging with moral realism um, is not moral realism, which I'm very critical of. And, you know, there's plenty of realists that are friendly and, and polite towards me, but you do occasionally get people that are snarky and rude and obnoxious. Um, and they just say, that, I, I don't know why people have to be so nasty about this stuff. Maybe they feel that there's stakes here. So if you're promoting anti-realism and they think of it as really bad consequences, you're doing some terrible disservice to humanity. And maybe people are going to go run out slaughtering people because they're moral anti-realists. I think that's ridiculous. But maybe they think the consequences are, are really bad. Or I think some people just are so on the opposite end of the philosophical spectrum as me. They think my views are stupid and ridiculous. And if I'm confidently going around presenting positions that you find stupid and ridiculous, you might find me stupid and ridiculous and say super critical things. I try to avoid that, though. I don't want that toxicity. I don't like it. Um, OK, so let's see what else people say here. All right. So we get a comment from Banner. Uh, to be honest, I think the most you could get ordinary people to affirm is that there are norms about moral language. As a quietist, I'm not sure how you're going to cash this out. Banner continues, I don't think ordinary people are going to be explicitly committed to stance independent facts and properties, as you said. Yeah, so I agree, of course. <laughs> I mean, that's it's my view that I'm talking about. So I agree with that. And uh, yeah, when I do the Destiny talk, there'll be more time where I get, I'll get into more detail. Um, I do have, I, I did record another video. So I don't know if I, I didn't ask if I could announce it, but I did record another video uh, where I talked about my dissertation and that research, which is a little different from standard meta ethics stuff. So the dissertation is in psychology and I don't defend. In fact, what's funny about that is a very long dissertation. There's lots of stuff in there. I don't argue for or against, uh, of, cool, not, of course not for, I don't argue for realism or against anti-realism in there. It's a descriptive project. Um, what I argue for is that meta ethical indeterminacy is probably the correct descriptive account of ordinary moral thought. All right. Let's see. Okay, cool. So we got a question here from Banner. A quick question about companions and guilt. What do you think is a good response to someone who will just concede and reject that there are any normative epistemic facts? I, I would agree with him. I deny that there are any. Well, we have to be clear here. Um, unfortunately, and this is what's one of the things that's funny about this is that um, some of the people that have characterized this argument, I think even the formal characterization from Cuneo drops the stance of dependent thing from being explicit in even the formal published versions of the arguments. So people will say, if you're an epistemic anti-realist, then you think that there are no normative facts. That's not true. It's just not true. That is an ambiguous statement that if you're an anti-realist, you think there are no normative facts. It's like saying if you are a moral anti-realist, you think there are no moral facts. That might seem obvious. It's not true. The way that people, and uh, sorry, I backtrack a little bit. It really depends on exactly how you're defining these positions. You could say that uh, moral real anti-realism just is the view that there are no moral facts, but typically, and this is the way I use the term, and it's with the way a lot of people use the term in the literature. I don't know which one is more common, but probably the way I use it. It's a view that in with respect to morality, that there are no stance independent moral facts. It's actually consistent with moral anti-realism to believe that there are moral facts. They're just not stance independent. Uh, and this would be, you know, uh, constructivist views, relativist views, so individual subjectivism, cultural relativism, and even some expressivist views that have deflationary accounts of truth would allow for it, for like you're an expressivist. And when you say murder is wrong, you think it, you say, yeah, it's true. The statement murder is wrong is true, but it's not true in the way that realists think that moral statements are true, or at least most realists. So there's, there's some dispute at the, at the edges of 
uh, these views about how exactly to classify realist and anti-realist positions. Some people want a more uh, robust account of realism, and I think that those views have largely come to dominate more recently. Uh, in other words, the view is more consistent with the way I draw the distinction. But these, term these distinctions are largely terminological. This is why there are plenty of positions that technically on the way I construe the distinction between realism and anti-realism, um, uh, the naturalist accounts of realism that I think actually could be true. They're perfectly intelligible. They could be true. I just find them to be trivial because I think that they are, they just end up consisting of descriptive claims. So that, you know, that really um, makes things complicated because you can't just say realism is false or realism is unintelligible or realism is trivial. It depends on the type of realism. And for me, naturalist and non-naturalist accounts of realism fall within the scope of what I define uh, the way I use the terminology to define as realism, but most relativist accounts don't. Some actually could because the relativism, non-relativism distinction is somewhat distinct. It's conceptually distinct from stance dependence versus stance independence. I think I talked about that a bit last week and I've talked about it in the past. I'm not going to get into that now, but you could have a relativist realism and you could have a, um, but a typically relativism in practice is going to be a anti-realist position because it's going to make the moral facts stance dependent. But yeah, a relativist could say, look, there are moral facts. It's just that the facts are true or false relative to the standards of individuals or groups. There are moral facts on that view. So the first thing is just that uh, epistemic anti-realist, I just deny that they deny that there are um, normative epistemic facts. So it, because that, and the other part of the, part of it is just that I think you need to be clear. I only deny that there are stance dependent epistemic facts. And in fact, if we want to be really clear, I only deny specifically that there are irreducibly normative stance independent epistemic facts. I have no problem with saying that there are stance independent epistemic facts understood in a naturalist way where they're reducible to descriptive claims um, about, you know, like, I don't know, evidential support relations or something like that. Uh, you could cash out the stance independent epistemic facts in some terms that I, you basically you naturalize them. And then I might be perfectly fine saying, yeah, there's facts like that, but they're not irreducibly normative. And so they don't have some sort of authority. They don't have this, this sort of clout or oomph that uh, robust realists want out of their normative systems. And so they might be true, but they're true in a way that to me looks like a kind of trivial relabeling of existing facts that I already grant. So th they might dispute that characterization, but that is my, my position on what those views amount to. So having said all that, uh, I don't really think that the epistemic, I, I, basically I think that the best way to respond to companions and guilt arguments. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with these, what they try to do is they try to say, hey, look, you, if you're a moral anti-realist, uh, you're going to have this problem, which is that if you want to reject moral anti-realism, actually many of the same reasons that would motivate one's rejection of moral anti-realism also motivate the rejection of epistemic realism. Uh, sorry, if I said anti-realism, I meant realism. So in other words, Whatever reasons you have for rejecting moral realism, if you were consistent, you would also reject epistemic realism. But there are epistemic facts that are stance independent. And so that's absurd. You're wrong if you do that. And so the realist that is committed to this, uh, sorry, the anti-realist that is committed to this parity premise between moral realism and epistemic realism is in a bind. You, The argument here goes that it's why, it's why it's called companions and guilt. You can't reject one without rejecting the other. And so if you don't want to reject epistemic realism, you can't reject moral realism. So that's roughly how those arguments function. And so one way of responding to these arguments is to deny the parity premise. You just deny that you have to reject epistemic realism to be consistent if you also reject moral realism. I think that's a route quite a lot of people might want to take. I actually haven't seen too many papers on it. I don't think there are that many. Um, but some people would want to go that route. That might be the sort of safer route where you have fewer commitments and you have less substantive of a position. Like, I'm just denying moral realism. I'm not necessarily denying epistemic realism. You could even be agnostic about it. But I just want to rip off the conceptual band-aid and reject both. And I already did before I ever knew about these arguments. I reject all forms of irreducible normativity. And so for me, I would just accept that there are no stance independent uh, normative epistemic facts. And I also go further. So some people that are anti-realists about normativity as a whole, uh, like Bart Sturmer, will argue that there's there are certain implications of this that I don't accept. So Sturmer argues that it's not possible to believe a sort of global normative error theory. Now, I'm not a normative error theorist. I'm a normative anti-realist. There are distinctions there. Uh, but I, you know, I'm not going to accept positions that maintain that there's something self-defeating 
about being a normative anti-realist. I think that those sorts of, so roughly the idea would be, uh, well, you're not justified in being an epistemic anti-realist because in order to be justified, you would need to have some sort of epistemic reason to reject that there are epistemic reasons. But if you deny that there's epistemic reasons, then you don't have any epistemic reasons for denying it. So you you can't do it. Uh, but I mean, one, that's, you know, you have to be careful. To, I, I do think that there are, in a certain sense, epistemic reasons. I just don't think that there are stance independent ones. Or you could say epistemic facts. Um, I do think there are epistemic facts, just not stance independent ones, just not irreducibly normative ones. I do think that, so I don't think realists sort of own the idea of epistemic facts. So one, I just deny that I don't have them. Um, but if they then want to say, no, 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 you have to have the stance independent ones. Well, I deny that too. Uh, and I don't, I don't think there's any implication. Like, in other words, these self-defeat arguments basically want to say, hey, the only success conditions you could have would be ones where you grant that there are these stance independent, irreducibly normative epistemic facts. But if you're going to deny that, then you can't succeed at being justified in denying it. But you could just say, I deny that there are those things, and I deny that I need those things in order to have a sort of justified position. You could justify things in accordance with some different set of standards. And if they, you know, they might not accept those, but too bad. All right. So... Second, so San says, um, by the way, Lance, do you think for words and statements to have meaning, they have to have communicative intent? If so, do you think that what AIs like ChatGPT says is meaningful? That's an interesting question. Um, what I would say is that there are facts about the communicative intent of speakers. An AI doesn't have communicative intent, um, not in the way that, I, well, I mean, it's going to depend on the AI. I think there certainly could be AIs that are conscious and have intentions and that sort of thing. I don't know if uh, ChatGPT has intentions. <laughs> I think that's an that's an open question. I would lean towards no, um, but there's a difference between um, what ChatGPT is doing and what people are doing. And if it's sort of just spitting out, like a, you know, it's who knows what sort of weird black box stuff is going on when it's spitting out information. That information can be used. It can be utilized. Um, and so we could just sort of. Um, you could sort of disentangle the questions of uh, is there communicative intent and is it saying things that one could interpret in ways that are useful and they could do something with the information. And then the answer to the first might be no, it has no communicative intent. Without the second one, uh, with the answer to the second one being yes, it's saying things, it, it's like spitting out strings of information that can be utilized in ways that are functionally useful. Uh, and so uh, I does it, can it mean something? Well, it doesn't, if it doesn't intend to communicate something, then in a certain sense, you could just say it doesn't, it, it's not communicating any particular meaning, but you could still extract some type of interpretation from it. I mean, think about if you had uh, just a machine that was just generating random letters, eventually you'll find things, you could find the sentence like, um, um, it is raining in Chicago right now, you know, a sentence like that. Now, is there any intention involved? No. Can you interpret the letters it is raining in chicago right now like it actually spells that out to be a statement about whether or not it is raining in chicago sure you can uh and so part of the issue here and i think there's the there's a sort of phantom sense that words can have a meaning independent of intent is that when you see that type of string of information we ourselves have a memory and experiences that we build up over our lifetimes of certain patterns, recurring patterns of typical usage of particular symbols and representations that are used to convey communicative intent of speakers. And so, it, you know, an isolated sentence, um, don't go to the store, uh, sounds like an instruction, even if nobody is giving the instruction, even if there's no context for it. And part of what might be happening in these sorts of situations is that we just build up knowledge and memory of what a person would typically mean, were they to assert this thing, and so you can kind of impute a kind of um, ghost intent onto even a randomly generated sentence and then treat it accordingly, even if there's no communicative intent of an actual speaker. So as long as we're clear on dissociating this sort of imputed intent or this sort of phantom intent from actual intent, you can take any random string of characters and interpret or sort of project an interpretation. And you could see that as a kind of functional meaning even though there wasn't anybody asserting it and nobody meant it in any particular way. I don't know if that, I feel like I would have to talk about this a lot more to fully address that, but hopefully that gives you some sense. Keep in mind also, this is my off the cuff preliminary 
quick response to that. It's not the sort of thing I've sat down and thought about. So if some of that was a bit less, um, and it should be, I'm not a philosopher of language and I don't specialize in that particular topic. Um, if that's less polished than what I might say about, you know, metaethical stuff like companions of guilt, um, fair enough. There might be issues with that. So if someone has issues or if someone has corrections of what I say about language stuff, I would absolutely love to talk to you. People with a background in philosophy of language and that sort of thing. Or if you study language cognition, that would be really cool too. All right. Let's have a look at other comments. Why am I doing this? I don't even need to do this to read the comments. Uh, yeah, so Banner says, personally, I think it would be really contentious to, uh, for statements to have meaning but have no intent. I don't think, I think most philosophers probably think they do have meaning without intent. In fact, I think, if anything, saying that meaning requires intent is the contentious claim. But yeah, the short answer to um, is what ChatGPT says is meaningful is that the, that's ambiguous. Um, and in a certain sense, no, and in a certain sense, yes. Uh, so, uh, Banner then says, do, do what Michael Humer does and just have a green screen with a bookshelf. I, <laughs> I, I really like that Michael Humer is so generous with his time and makes all these appearances, but I wish he would do something other than have that terrible, um, Green screen, because wherever he's at when he's doing that, I don't know if it's the same place or different places, it's not set up well. If you've seen humor make these appearances, you see all the the distortions at the edges around him and stuff like that. It, it doesn't look good. And I I, uh, I wish humor would get a better setup. Humor also has had some really horrific mics in the past, like microphones. Um, <laughs> I say mics, his name is Mike. Well, it's humor. Uh, but yeah, he needs a better microphone. Um, that would be great. I mean, but this is this is frequently true. I, like, I need a better one or at least I need a better setup to make the most use of the one that I have. So we could all do better on this. All right. Jonathan Becker says, yo, I'm a bit late, gonna start from the beginning. Okay, so you might not, so I do this a lot. I see people streams and then I start and then I comment and then they're addressing me live, but I'm seeing the old things. So it's like I'm dealing with them in the past and then that could get really confusing and um, unclear what's going on. All right, I'm looking at comments. Okay, so Griff says, I am curious about the ontology of your preferences or attitudes towards typical considered moral views. You will have to elaborate. I don't know where, what exactly you mean there. Right. So Jonathan Becker says, just getting to the part where you talk about the thesis of your dissertation, it's honestly pretty nuts that anyone thinks the folk have positions on big philosophical topics. So to be fair, um, they don't have to think people have like explicit, like they certainly don't think people have sophisticated, developed philosophical views on these issues. It's not like philosophers go around thinking that ordinary people are going to say something like, ah, oh, yes, I am an analytic naturalist and I believe that moral claims are analytic analytically equivalent to certain uh, claims consistent with the natural sciences. Like they, they don't think that. That would be silly, and they don't think that. Uh, what they might say is, look, when you say something like murder is wrong, um, there's at any, you assert these moral claims in a variety of contexts. Um, you and other people are part of a linguistic community that has, there's a sort of underlying structure to those patterns of speech. And that structure doesn't have to be something you're explicitly aware of. Think about the way our language has a grammar to it. There are grammatical rules. And most of us that become native speakers of a language as adults, we're very familiar with what sentences are ill-formed or not. We could, we could do this so quickly that I, I'm talking in real time in mostly, mostly grammatical sentences, I hope. Uh, but I don't have to consciously think about the grammatical rules. I don't even have to know what they are. And so if you take people and you give them a list of sentences in a language that they're a native speaker of, uh, they could judge this language to be well-formed or not, is grammatical or not grammatical. But if you ask them to just describe the grammatical rules of their language, like just give me the list, th most people are gonna struggle to give you much of any of the rules. Um, and you know, English professors can, but most people don't know the grammatical rules. And so by analogy, uh, when people make moral claims, there is, a, there is presumably an implicit pattern or, or sort of underlying structure to the principle, there's a sort of principled 
deployment conditions where they would make these claims in some cases and they wouldn't make them in other places, uh, other places, other places. And that that's those sort of deployment conditions. They have a sort of, you could say, an implicit sense of when it is and isn't appropriate to make a moral claim. And that is driven by some sort of natural competence at the appropriate conditions in which to employ these these terms. And that those deployment conditions are themselves underwritten by a sort of underlying principles that are presumably consistent and reasonable. And that it, it's sort of implicit. It's built. It's a feature of the language that the moral claims of a language e express or exhibit a commitment to certain uh, presuppositions. It doesn't have to be a sort of claim about the human psychology. Now, I don't think that language is that way. I don't think that there's a sort of external set of commitments that are sort of non-psychological. Uh, but that's one characterization of language that you um, that you could suppose is going on. Now, if you think that sounds really weird and that nobody actually thinks that, give me one second. I bring this quote up all the time, but it's worth returning to it. One second. I'm pulling it up now. Okay, so here is a quote from Walter Sennett Armstrong in the paper Mixed Up Metaethics. It's actually a response to the paper that motivated my dissertation, uh, Gill's paper on metaethical indeterminacy and variability. So here is what Sennett Armstrong says. There are two ways to describe moral language. An internal project seeks to capture the psychological processes or representations that actually occur when people use moral language. However, Contemporary realists and expressivists are not trying to do that. When Jackson and Petit use networks of truisms or when Gibbard cites hyperstates, they surely know that these theoretical constructions do not reflect actual psychological entities or events. Instead, they want their theories to be externally adequate in capturing the outputs of our linguistic systems without necessarily reflecting the internal workings of that system. In this respect, their project is more like Chomsky and grammar, which uses constructs without claiming psychological reality. And this is where I'm gonna take big issue with these sorts of approaches. If this is an accurate account of what metaethicists are doing, I think they're relying on a full, a incorrect conception of how language works. I don't think they're externally adequate. What externally adequate, what does that even mean? Well, I, I, it just sounds like nonsense to me. Um, now, I, I know that I say that quite frequently, uh, but this is a case where, um, you know, it's not so much that I find this necessarily unintelligible. I just, I mean, if this, what is this a description of? If it's not people's psychological states, what are we describing? We're describing the language as if the language has a meaning apart from, from the people using the language. I, look, if someone thinks that that means something, they're welcome to top on here and try to tell me what, what the hell that means. So I don't, I don't think that's a thing. Um, so that's one thing. They could also take these to be implicit commitments that do have some claim of psychological reality. It doesn't have to be explicit. It could also be sort of an inchoate and underdeveloped theories so people, uh, or it could be a dispositional account where you say, look, I'm not saying people have explicit theories, but people are disposed to endorse these theories when they hear about them. So there's a variety of different ways where philosophers could soften their claims so that they're not quite as like transparently implausible as you might think if you take them to be saying like ordinary people go around thinking of themselves as realists or anti-realists. They don't have to think that and philosophers don't think that they have to think that. Philosophers could take, could take a lot of this to be either not psychological at all or to fly under the psychological radar outside of clear and direct introspective awareness. I hope that adequately addresses that question. All right, I'm gonna look at some of the other comments. One second. Oh, right. All right. I have people making uh, suggestions. So I have one person, uh, it's Ponzer33 says, get some dang posters, Lance. Uh, I've had posters before. I, what would I even have a poster of? All right. Jonathan Becker says that Lance is too old for posters after undergrad. It stands independent aesthetic fact, 
that posters are okay. I actually only had posters after I was a grad student. I don't even, I, I lost most of them. I had some, I had some decent posters back in the day. Our most normative, oh, sorry. This is from John Martin. Our most normative ethicists, moral realists. If so, any theories as to why? Um, let's check specifically whether most of them are. I'm going to guess that the answer is yes. I'm going to say it's probably about 50. Uh, sorry, it's probably between 60 and 70%. And the reason for that is that, well, let me just pull it up. So back in, uh, there, back in 2020, they released this survey, the 2020 Phil Papers survey. Maybe it was released after 2020. I don't know. But anyway, it's a 2020 Phil Paper survey. And what that is, is it's a survey that was sent out to people. They had to meet various criteria to get to be to participate in the survey. And it mostly consists of analytic philosophers. Analytic philosophy is a sort of it's like a branch of Western philosophy that is predominantly associated with uh, British and American and the sort of Anglophone world. It's like Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And, um, you know, whatever other countries are largely uh, like broadly associated with the Anglosphere. Um, anyway, so uh, that it's this particular branch of philosophy. Most of the respondents are from that. There's some continental philosophers and people from a few other traditions, but unfortunately it's mostly covering this like fairly narrow group. It might comprise most philosophers, but it's still sort of uh, methodologically and, and historically a fairly distinctive group of philosophers. And that found that 62% of the overall respondents, and it was 1,785 respondents, uh, favored moral realism. Either they leaned it towards it or accepted it. But they do have the results specifically for um, for people by area of specialization, and they should have, they'll have normative ethics. So let's have a look. So I'm looking at it now. In fact, I will post a link once I have it up here. Normative ethics is there, excellent. So I will post that in the comments. Yep, there it is. And as you can see, I said between 60 and 70, I was right, but just barely. It's 69.94% endorse uh, moral realism. So just barely within those perimeters. So yeah, it's a majority of normative ethicists favor moral realism. Uh, I do have a blog series on why I think realism might be fairly popular among professional philosophers. Um, I'll mention a couple of the reasons. And oh, it's called the Phil Papers Fallacy, if you want to check it out. So in fact, if you Google it, you might even find there's probably not too many things called Phil Papers Fallacy. Uh, a big part of this is going to be selection effects. It, imagine you don't believe that there are stance independent moral facts. You're not a moral realist. You might be less inclined to think that engaging in normative moral theory is a particularly useful or interesting enterprise. And so you wouldn't do it for the same reason people that don't believe in God are probably less likely to specialize in philosophy of religion. So probably a big factor here are selection effects, that anti-realists are less likely to study normative ethics. So that wouldn't show that studying normative ethics makes you a realist. It would show that people that are already realists are more likely to study normative ethics. So you have the causal chain reversed. That's gonna be one factor. And then there's also gonna be whatever other ambient background factors are driving the anti-real, sorry, the realist rate to be up so high. Um, I could speculate on why that is. Um, Largely, I think that people with a disposition for realism are more likely to become philosophers in general. And I think that um, the methods that contemporary analytic philosophers employ dispose the field towards certain types of linguistic and conceptual confusions that make it more likely to find realism in appealing position. And that's one of the major factors I address in the Phil Papers Fallacy blog series. I'll just post it here so you can find it. Ah, it doesn't come up when you look right away. There we go. I am going to have to aggregate because it's a nine part series. It's a big series. There it is. That's part one. You could find the rest of it on my blog. I'd recommend just checking that out because that's something I sat down and thought about instead of just my off the cuff remarks. But the selection effects are probably going to be a big factor there. All right, I see some, some interesting comments here. I don't know if I want to get into all of them. Okay, so um, we have another uh, comment from Sam. Uh, your answer is pretty interesting, especially the bit about ghost intentions. 
Yeah, it's it, basically what I'm saying is that a a person can interpret any random set of information or symbols as information and then use it accordingly. They can sort of impute or project an interpretation onto it, even though there was no intention from the person or even that it doesn't have to be a person from whatever the source is for the, the language in question. Yeah, I think you're right that most philosophers, we have it open, let's look. Whether most philosophers, so sorry, the rest of the comment is from what I remember, the Phil paper survey stated most philosophers were semantic externalist. I think that that's probably right. And so that would be one of the positions that I'm going to reject. Um, so we have semantic content, minimalism, moderate contextualism, radical contextualism, vagueness, epistemic, metaphysical, semantic, response to external world skepticism. So um, I'm not sure which one of those uh, you think would be the most appropriate question. They might not have the, the categories that would make, make that I would be the most familiar with or that I would be able to break down readily in real time. But yeah, it's, I suspect most would be externalists. But we would need to get, I would need to get clear on what exactly these questions are asking. I, I can't do it in real time when I see that I have like five minutes. Um, so that's something to bring up later, I guess. Okay, you say you prefer Cass? Okay, cool. Then I'll call you Cass. Awesome, thanks. Oh, that was a while ago. So I am, somehow I got way behind. All right. Um, Twin Earth, I'm not going to be able to address that now, not in five minutes. So that's something that we'll get into later. So I'm probably going to have to start wrapping up. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to buy into these semantic externalist accounts. All right. So I don't see a whole lot uh, else as far as questions and comments that I could respond to. Uh, so I guess, I guess I'll start wrapping stuff up there. What else was I going to mention? Oh, right. Um, so I also have a, another blog post that I just wrote kind of on the fly. And the interesting thing about this one, I guess, well, I noticed this is that, um, it is a response. You can see here actually it makes more sense to pin it so you could follow the link directly. Second, there we go. So uh, I recently responded to Patrick Flynn, who has um, a blog that, what is the name of the blog? So the Journal of Absolute Truth, something like that. Uh, anyway, uh, so that blog was actually the first blog that ever prompted me to, to get my blog started in the first place. So that ever responded, <laughs> that was a weird way of phrasing it. Okay, let me start over. I started the blog about a year ago. I think it was last August. And the first thing I did, I just was like, I wanted to respond to this, this stuff from Patrick Flynn from uh, this particular blog. I think there's a, a YouTube channel as well. Uh, and I got really amped up and I'm like, all right, I'm going to create a blog. I'm going to write my response. And I did. It was my very first blog post was a response on moral realism. And I am kind of returning to my roots in writing another response. And uh, yeah, so I, I wrote that response up. And it covers, it's a sort of, it's almost like a greatest hits. I think there's like 10 or 11 things in there. I had a particularly, I think, effective characterization of normative entanglement, which is one of the key ideas that I discuss in there. And I return to a lot of my sort of critical remarks that realists make about anti-realists. So maybe that's something I could um, move some of my discussions back and go over that next week, or maybe I'll just roll it to the end because I think I already have a couple things slated. I think I'll do that easier for me. Um, but I'll discuss that at some point too. So there, I mean, I'll give you one example of that and then I'll head out because I've got about five minutes. Let's see which one. I'll do a couple quick ones. One of them is just uh, like, take this first one. So here's a comment from Patrick. After all, if somebody is forced into nihilism to quote, justify their take on abortion, then it's probably because the pro-life side has some powerful argumentation behind it. Notice the framing here. People are forced to, to um, be an anti-realist. And you'll typically see a lot of the way that people frame anti-realism is that it's some sort of like dirty, undesirable position that you retreat to when you don't have any other choice. And 
I just reject that. I don't, it's not like a fallback position that I retreat to because I can't handle realism because of all the metaphysical commitments. I just think the metaphysical commitments are really, I, I don't have them. I don't find them plausible. I don't think there's good arguments for them. But what you'll see in the exchanges between realists and anti-realists is this presumption that anti-realism is like a last resort. And I don't accept the framing. I think there's something polemical and rhetorical about that. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, so you have this remark from Patrick. One must not miss the radicality of such a view, a view that is not the majority position among philosophers, which you just talked about. As most philosophers, particularly ethicists, are more realists. Um, this is something, of course, a comment that I just mentioned, the Phil Papers fallacy, where I address why, yeah, I mean, m people thinking something is a little bit of evidence for it, it's not very good evidence. The fact that people believe in Bigfoot is some evidence in Bigfoot, but it's terrible evidence. It's not convincing at all that Bigfoot exists. Uh, it's the same for most other things. The fact that a lot of people believe in God is some evidence of God. It's not good evidence of God. Uh, a lot of people believe in UFOs or aliens. It's not good evidence of aliens or flying around the earth and saucers or whatever. Uh, people believing things is always going to be some evidence. Some of those people might be have greater expertise or competence than other people, and then it increases the degree of evidence. But just the mere fact that people believe something is true is not in and of itself any sort of direct evidence that should be taken all that seriously. Um, beyond the presumption that people's beliefs uh, tend to be like the fact that someone believes something on Bayesian grounds is should cause you to update in favor of being more likely to, to be true compared to the counterfactual in which they don't believe it nobody believed in bigfoot and nobody ever reported seeing bigfoot that would be more consistent with bigfoot not existing than the fact that people do report seeing bigfoot thing is it's still consistent with bigfoot not existing that, pe that some people would report it anyway but that would need to be accounted for so when you consider these sorts of counterfactuals, the fact that anybody believes anything is going to be some evidence. Uh, the fact that they are experts at something might count. So, but like, I don't grant that philosophers are sort of experts being correct about philosophical positions. They might be experts at evaluating arguments or doing logic. Doesn't mean that they're going to, they could, you know, be really bad at truth tracking on moral issues due to various biasing factors. And it might be that training in philosophy doesn't fully or even adequately eliminate them at all. So that's going to be an issue. So you have issues like that. Um, and then what else? I think there's a good one here. Yeah, so I don't even want to, to read this one, but Patrick says, again, it is often worthwhile to have anti-realists go on the record about these things, since if they want to be consistent with their position, they will have to say what no human person should ever want to say concerning matters of, and then he goes on to mention like really just awful stuff. And uh, that's where the normative entanglement comes in because there's this sort of, the, the anti-realist can't say certain sorts of things that are really bad. And uh, the, typically the idea would be something like the anti-realist can't say that torturing babies is wrong. Well, one, yes, anti-realists can say these things. They just can't. Um, if cer certain anti-realists Take it, like the bottom line is an anti-realist that thinks that ordinary moral claims are mistaken in some way, like an error theorist. Well, you don't have to speak in accordance with how ordinary people speak. If ordinary people have false presuppositions about physics, if they think like motion is non-relative or some, or, you know, some weird account of physics, like if their folk physics accounts um, are false, does that mean you can't say objects move in space? Of course you can. It's just you have. A, a, you mean something different than ordinary people. And an error theorist could just say, yeah, look, ordinary people, when they say murder is wrong, they think that it's wrong in some way that's weird and magical. I don't accept that, but I think murder is wrong. And by that, I mean this. You could say, oh, well, you're changing the meaning of the language. Realists don't own language. And you're not obliged to speak in accordance with the false presuppositions of ordinary language. You're not required to. You can just not do so. You get, I mean, you get to mean whatever you want when you say things. And so an anti-realist can absolutely say things are wrong. Now, it might be a little weird for them to say things are objectively or stance independently wrong unless they're redefining that. And that would be a little misleading and weird. So yeah, sure. An anti-realist, it would be inconsistent with anti-realism for them to say things inconsistent with anti-realism. They're not in a position to say murder is stance independently wrong. But all, that the idea here that like, oh, I want you to go on the record saying that murder isn't wrong. Uh, well, one, you just can, you could, as an anti-realist, you could deny that. You could say, no, I'm not going to go on the record saying that because I don't think that. I do think murder is wrong. I just think it's wrong in a way consistent with anti-realism. 
Uh, but if they want to say, okay, well, I want you on the record saying that murder isn't stance independently wrong. Okay, there's no problem with that. And if someone goes, oh, so you're saying torturing babies doesn't stance independently wrong? That's, that's what, why? Why is that? What is radical or extreme about that? It has no implications for whether you think baby torture is wrong to say it's not stance independently wrong. It has no implications for your attitudes, your behavior, your actions, the policies you favor. You, you could find, you could be just as opposed to it. You could act, and it, there's no, you can act exactly like a realist would act. And yet what, um, what um, Patrick says is basically that anti-realists act in a way inconsistent with their supposed anti-realist views. They act like realists. It's nonsense. It's just not true. There's no way that realists act like if a realist goes around um, making judgments and helping people and not murdering, they're acting like a realist. But if you do that uh, and you're an anti-realist, you're being inconsistent because it's completely consistent with anti-realism to be nice to people and not murder people and to make moral judgments. Nothing about anti-realism prohibits you from doing any of those things. And I think that uh, Patrick and other people often take it that anti-realists um, like can't do those things in a way that would be consistent with anti-realism. And I think they're just mistaken about this. Um, and I, so I, I would be happy to talk to Patrick about this, uh, but okay. So I'm at the hour mark. I am going to have to go. Um, so let me wrap up now. It looks like there's one last question from Cass. Let's see. Uh, by the way, Lance, do you know if there is a philosopher's equivalent for psychologists and their disciplines in the social sciences? Oh, Phil Papers equivalent. Uh, sorry, I missed Phil Papers. Okay, let me reread that. Um, by the way, Lance, do you know if there is a Phil Papers equivalent for psychologists and other disciplines in the social sciences? As far as I know, there is not. I haven't seen anything like that, like a comprehensive survey of what psychologists think about, say, psychological issues. That would be super cool to see something like that. If someone knows about one, um, please mention it in the comments because I'm about to wrap up here. So putting it in the stream doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not aware of any. Uh, that's a good question. I do hope someone puts that together. I don't know what kind of questions they would ask, it, and it might be a lot less fun and interesting than the philosophical ones. Because the philosophical one is like teletransporter cases and all these sorts of things people love to talk about. Uh, I think the psychology one would be a lot more technical, like whether you think that ego depletion is a, a genuine and non-negligible psychological phenomenon or something like that. Um, okay, so I'm going to have to wrap up the stream there. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I had to keep it short today. So please like, subscribe. Um, you know, do all those things, leave comments in the comments uh, section. I'd like to get conversations going here. I do tend to respond to comments. I'll often respond to as many of them as I foreseeably can. Uh, and I'll have some more announcements, um, you know, next week about some things that are, are coming up for me. All right. Thanks everybody. And, uh, take care.